good morning. My uh, parents were born in Baghdad, Iraq, which, as you know, isn't a great vacation destination these days. Um, <clears throat> But uh, my brother and I, even though my parents were raised in that culture, they did not raise us as Muslims. They actually raised us as Christians. And the reason is, is because my people, my ethnic background, are typically people who follow the Christian faith. And um, uh, so growing up, uh, it turned out, as I discovered, that my ethnic background is what's called Assyrian. Now, this is not to be confused with the country Syria, which has people called Syrians, those people are typically Muslim. I am what's known as Assyrian. So just out of curiosity, with a show of hands, raise your hand if you've heard of the Assyrian people at some point in your life. It looks like a lot of you have, yeah. Chances are, if you're familiar with your Old Testament history, you'll recall the Assyrians are actually talked a lot about in the Old Testament, which sounds pretty cool. Until you realize we were actually the sworn enemies of Israel. <laughs> So consequently, that made us the sworn enemies of God, you know. So that was kind of a bummer growing up and finding that out. But I remember my parents, they would always try to um, spin that sort of negative fact in, in a positive way. It never worked, but nevertheless, God bless them, they, they would always try to do that. So when I was maybe seven or eight years old, they would tell me, hey, guess what, little Alan? Guess what? Our people are talked about in the Bible. But you know what? We're the bad guys, you know. So with a lot of therapy and counseling, I got over the emotional turmoil of knowing God doesn't love me and have a wonderful plan for my life. No, he does. I'm just kidding. But no doubt I had some issues growing up. But enough about my issues. Let's, let's talk about the question of how we can respond in love to our Muslim neighbors. And if you have your workbook out, turn to page 16. I have an outline there for you to follow along uh, in terms of the direction that we're going this morning. Well, as many of you know, on the morning of September 11th, 2001, 19 Muslim terrorists hijacked four airplanes and used them as missiles to attack the United States. They, of course, damaged the Pentagon. They destroyed the World Trade Center. And in the process, they killed 2,975 innocent civilians. Just 29 days after that event, Oprah Winfrey invited Queen Rania on her TV show. Now, Queen Rania is the queen of a Muslim country, the country of Jordan. And Queen Rania allegedly is a devout Muslim herself. So allegedly, Queen Rania can speak on behalf of Islam. And as you can imagine, her job that day was to fix Islam's massive public relations problem. Because up until that day, most Americans hadn't thought too much about Islam. Sure, maybe they had seen a few Arnold Schwarzenegger movies where Arnold goes after the, the bad guys in the movie, right? The, uh, the Arab terrorists. But many Americans were now wondering, wait a minute, is this what Islam's about? Do they want to fly airplanes into our buildings? That seems crazy. And so Queen Rania had to answer a couple of questions on the TV program that morning. And the first was this. Do Muslims want to violently force their religion on the rest of the world? And to this question, Queen Rania said no. She says the fact that Islam is very tolerant means that it doesn't impose anything on other people. Now, Oprah Winfrey, being the, uh, the good feminist that she is, of course, is also wondering, wait a minute, I've seen women in Islam. I've seen how many times they are denied equal rights. Some of them aren't allowed to get driver's license. They're not allowed to get educated. Many of them are forced to wear clothing that covers them from head to toe. And she's looking at Queen Rania, who's dressed kind of like you or I would dress. Well, not me, but the women in the room, of course. <laughs> And she's thinking, you know, you're not dressed like that. What's going on? Doesn't Islam oppress women? And to this question, Queen Rani said, no. She says, it, it, Islam treats women as full and equal partners to men. So women's rights are guaranteed in Islam. Now, she said a lot of other things that day on the program. And of course, as you know, President George Bush was the president at the time. And he had to make a number of different statements about Islam. He said, look, Islam's a peaceful religion. And Muslims are a peace-loving people. And even President Obama had to weigh in on the issue a number of times and speaking in Cairo, uh, in, in Egypt, to the Muslim world just five months after he was uh, elected president, he wrote this, the Holy Quran, which is their holy book, teaches that whoever kills an innocent, it's just as if he has killed all mankind. And whoever saves a person, it's like he saved all mankind. And here, by the way, President Obama is paraphrasing or, or 
loosely quoting a verse from the Quran. And the idea is, look, in Islam, killing just one innocent person is as wrong as killing everyone in humanity. So clearly what the 9-11 terrorists did was not legitimate, was not Islamic. And so we often hear a lot of these politically correct statements like this. And then we wonder, okay, so maybe, there are, maybe this is a peaceful religion. Maybe these are peaceful people. But then you turn on the news and almost on a regular basis, you see terrorist acts committed in the name of Islam. And so then you wonder, okay, so which is it? Which is the true Islam? Is it one of those two? Is it something in between? Will the real Islam please stand up, you know, so I can figure this out? Are Muslims the enemy? Are they the ones we're supposed to fear? And so we have a lot of questions running around in our mind. And I want to suggest to you that the Bible gives us a principle that can help us to make sense of all this and to move forward. And I want to turn your attention to something that the Apostle Paul write, writes under, the, of course, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20. And Paul here has just told the Corinthian believers that they are a new creation. So this is that very famous passage. They're a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. And he starts to share with the Corinthians some of the benefits that come with being a follower of Jesus Christ. And then he comes to our passage. And here's what Paul writes. He says, all of this, meaning all the benefits that come with being a follower of Jesus, are from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making his appeal through us. Now, Paul tells us, I believe, two important things about our identity and about our mission in this particular passage. And number one is this. Paul says, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus, then you already are an ambassador for Christ. Okay? That is not a title that is given to you after you've been a Christian 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And then we're like, okay, you are now an ambassador. Pin the blue ribbon upon your chest. You know, Carry on and do ambassadorial-like things. No. Paul says, the instant you step over the line and decide to follow Jesus, you become his ambassador. You become his representative. That means however you come across to other people, whether you come across as gracious, winsome, friendly, kind, and inviting, or you come across as condescending, crass, harsh, and basically like a jerk. However you come across to people, that will ultimately be a reflection upon the good name of Jesus Christ. And so we all, if we claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, have to ask ourselves a critical question. What kind of ambassador am I like? Am I a good and effective one or am I a bad and ineffective one? Because regardless, you are saying something about Jesus because you represent him. So Paul says, number one, we are an ambassador. That is our identity. But Paul also tells us something about the nature of our mission. And notice what word does Paul use in that previous passage we just looked at about five times in different forms? It's the word reconcile. And the word reconcile is the idea of bringing two parties who are at enmity with one another together in a, in a kind of a friendly relationship. And the picture the Bible has is you have God and you have the world and they are at enmity with one another. They are enemies. But Paul says to the Corinthians, you have been reconciled. You've been made at peace with God. And so now it's your job, it's your mission to proclaim that same message that people can be reconciled to God. It's your job to proclaim that message to the rest of the world. So what's interesting about this text is that it answers a question that many Christians ask throughout their lives. What's God's will for my life? Who am I? What am I supposed to be doing? Well, Paul answers it quite nicely. Here's the answer to that question. Number one, you are an ambassador for Jesus. And number two, you're called to proclaim the message of reconciliation to all people. Now, There you go. In a nutshell, that's the answer. Of course, how that's going to flesh itself out amongst the body believers as large as this is going to vary from person to person because obviously the Holy Spirit empowers different people with different gifts. But generally speaking, that is our identity and that is our mission. And so the key question then becomes, how do we fulfill that role and accomplish that mission with regards to Islam and Muslims? And I believe we should 
accomplish it in the same way an ambassador, like a political ambassador would do it. And ambassadors, political ambassadors typically do two, do two things. First, they learn about the people group they're gonna reach out to. And then after that, they go and engage the people group. And I submit to you, we should just do the same exact thing when it comes to Islam and Muslims. We should learn about Islam, we should learn about Muslims, and then we should engage them. So I wanna break up our discussion this morning in those two areas. First, we need to, as an ambassador, learn about Islam and about Muslims. And if you think about it, any political ambassador, let's just say we're gonna send an ambassador to China, right? Before that ambassador goes to China, they're gonna take some time to learn about the country, the demographics, the history, the language, the people, their foreign policy concerns. Why? so they can draw upon that knowledge to more carefully craft their message. And the same is true of Christian ambassadors to Muslims. We also wanna learn about Islam, the religion, the people, the doctrines, their behavior, their culture. Why? So we can draw upon that knowledge to more carefully craft our message, which of course is God's message, which of course is the message that all people can be reconciled to God to be made at peace with him. And so that's the way we should approach the issue of Islam and Muslims. Let's first learn about them. And there's many ways you can do that. You can read a book, you can take a class, you can talk to your Muslim friend or neighbor, maybe you have a family member, take them out to Starbucks, sit down with some tea and just say, hey, you know what? I don't know much about Islam, frankly. Would you just tell me about your faith? I'd love to learn more about it. You can do that. I go to mosques all over the country and I've never been uh, inhibited or stopped or mistreated at a mosque. And you can just go to a mosque, I'm not saying you should, but you can go to a mosque and just sit down and talk to the imam, the head of the mosque, and say, hey, tell me about Islam, I'd love to learn. There's so many ways to learn about it, but here's the problem that many of you might face if you did that. You might talk to a Muslim, even a devout Muslim, and they might tell you things about what they say Islam teaches, but then you'll hear a whole bunch of other things that seem to contradict what that Muslim said from other Muslims. And then you're back to the same point. You're wondering, well, so how do I know which is truly Islamic or not? How do I make sense of this question? And it turns out that there is a simple tactic to help you to do this. And it's an important distinction to make, okay? And the distinction you wanna make is, there's a distinction between what Muslims say and what Islam teaches. And this will be really a running theme through everything I say this morning. There's a difference between what Muslims say and what Islam teaches. And so if you want to know whether a teaching is truly Islamic or not, sure, it's fine to listen to what Muslims say, but the most important thing is to figure out what does Islam teach. And the way to figure out what it teaches is to look at what authoritative sources say. What matters in Islam is authority. What do authoritative sources in Islam say? That's what tells you what is truly Islamic. Because think about it, if you're a pastor, I'm not saying the pastor of this church, Phil, you know, but, or, or, or whoever the, you know, your pastors are, but if your pastors here said something that was contrary to what Jesus taught or what the scriptures said, you'd say, well, yeah, some Christians might say some things, but what, the, what really is true is what the Bible teaches. The same is exactly true with Islam. It doesn't matter what Muslims say. What matters is what Islam teaches. And so there are three key authoritative sources that I want you to become familiar with to help you determine whether a teaching is truly Islamic or not. The first is this, it's the Quran, okay? The Quran is believed by Muslims to be the literal words of God, the literal words of Allah. It's about the size of the New Testament and it is the highest authority in Islam. In fact, they have such a high view of the Quran in Islam that they would say that the corollary in Christianity is not the Bible, but Christ himself. Because they say, you know, just like we say in in Christianity, Christ is the divine logos, the divine word. So Muslims would say, well, the the Quran is the divine word. And so the Quran is the, literally the highest authority in Islam. But there's another important source of authority. It's called the Hadith or Hadith literature. Now the Hadith literature contains written traditions of what Muhammad either said, did, or approved of. Muhammad was a man who lived in the seventh century, Saudi Arabia. They believe that he was a prophet of of God, which is just merely a human being, but still commissioned to be a prophet. 
And so everything that he said or did or approved of on almost any subject has been categorized and put into these huge volumes. I have some, they're, they're huge volumes. So all the things he said about prayer or about marriage or about war or about divorce or about worship has been categorized into these sections. And so you can see, what did Muhammad say or do or approve of regarding these topics? Now, Hadith literature is not on par with the Quran. It's below the Quran in terms of authority. But nonetheless, it is still extremely authoritative. And here's why. The Quran provides really broad principles, but this Hadith literature gives very specific applications on how to apply those principles. So for example, the Quran might command you to pray. But the Hadith will tell you how to pray, when to pray, how often to pray, which direction to pray, all that stuff. The Quran might command you to fight, but the Hadith will tell you how to fight, who to fight, when to fight, when to start, when to end, all the details. How many here have heard of Sharia law? Raise your hand if you've heard of Sharia law. Looks like most of you have. Sharia law is simply Islamic law that is instituted in various Islamic countries. Where do they get the ideas for those Islamic laws? They get them from the Hadith literature because it's got very practical applications. So you could use it for a whole bunch of civil and uh, legal issues. Now, a third source of authority is the Sunnah. And the Sunnah is simply the life example of Muhammad. In other words, Muslims believe that Muhammad is the supreme or perfect embodiment of what it means to be a Muslim. So just like Christians used to have those bracelets that said, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Because we think, how did Jesus live? We should do the same thing. If Muslims had that bracelet, it would say WWMD, you know, what would Muhammad do? They don't have those bracelets, but I'm saying if they did, it'd be like that. Because in their mind, how Muhammad lived in his day is authoritative for Muslims today. And there's a book called The Life of Muhammad, written by Ibn Ishaq. It's about 200 years after Muhammad lived. It's the earliest extant biography we have of Muhammad written by Muslims, given to the world to understand how did Muhammad live. And we can tell based on that, oh, okay, he did this, therefore we should do this as well. So notice then, we have three sources of authority that we can turn to in Islam, the Quran, the Hadith, and the Sunnah. And this provides us a very handy tactic, a tool to help us determine whether a teaching or a behavior is truly Islamic. If it's consistent with those three sources or if it's explicitly taught by those three sources, then it's Islamic. If it's rejected by those three sources or not addressed in there, it's not Islamic. So it doesn't matter what Queen Rania says on Oprah Winfrey's TV show. She could say that Islam is about needlepoint and flying kites. It wouldn't make it true. What matters in Islam is authority and those are three sources of authority. So let's take then as an example, a test case. Let's look and see what does Islam say about the question of violent jihad? Because it's a question that I get asked all the time. Is violent jihad a valid doctrine in Islam? Or is it a, is it a, um, like a hijacking of the, of the Quranic text? Is it a misinterpretation? Well, again, the answer would not be found by just simply asking Queen Rania or the local imam at a mosque or your Muslim friend or neighbor unless they were able to point you to what? Those three authoritative sources. So let's just briefly look at what those three sources say about this question. Now, keep in mind, I am not asking the question here, do most Muslims practice violence? I'll get to that in a minute, but I do not believe that's the case. Most Muslims are peaceful, loving, caring people. I have been going and interacting with Muslims virtually all my life. I travel to the Middle East on a regular basis. I go to mosques in the Middle East. Most Muslims I know are very kind, thoughtful, considerate people. The question is not here, are Muslims violent and dangerous? The question I'm asking is, does Islam as a religious system teach that violence is a valid part of their religion? So let's take a look. What does the Quran say? Well, the Quran has 164 verses that teach about violent jihad explicitly. So it would be hard to read the Quran and say, no, it doesn't teach this. Of course it teaches it. You, you would have to not be able to read in order to say it doesn't, it's not in there. And uh, I, wrote, I wrote there Surah 9. Surah just means chapter. So chapter 9 in the Quran 
is one example of a chapter that contains a whole bunch of teaching about the nature of violent jihad and how one is supposed to engage in it. So you could read then the highest authority in Islam, look at chapter nine, and you can go online and you could read a whole Quran online. It's all available for free. Or you could order one or go to a bookstore and get one. But it's in there. It's, it's unmistakable. You can't avoid it. Now, that's the Quran, but we also find it in the Hadith. The Hadith, again, is what Muhammad said, did, or approved of. And since he was regularly involved in raiding caravans to get money, since he was regularly involved in leading assaults on other people and on other people groups, naturally, the things he had to answer and talk about were military kinds of stuff. And, of course, a whole bunch of what he says is about violent jihad. It's clearly taught in the Hadith. Here we see when to fight, who to fight. Here we see where apostasy is considered a capital crime. If you are a Muslim and you abandon your Islamic faith, that is a capital crime. You can be killed for it. This is where we get that from. It's taught in the Hadith literature. Homosexual behavior is considered to be a capital crime. Where do we learn from that? We get it from the Hadith literature. Okay, so all those details are found in the Hadith literature. And then we have the Sunnah. How did Muhammad live? And we can just go to his biography, again, given to us by Muslims to the world, so we understand how did Muhammad live? You can get the book on Amazon, Life of Muhammad by Ibn Ishaq, the earliest biography we have. And you will see his life, at least for half the time when he was leading Islam, was regularly involved in all kinds of warfare. And so, of course, those things become... um, prescriptive for Muslims today because how he lived is, is relevant for Muslims today. And uh, when we read the biography, we see all kinds of things. He ordered the assassination of non-combatants, women who sang satirical songs against him. He ordered them to be assassinated. Men who performed, um, who, who did uh, um, financial transactions with the Muslims, some of those people, Muhammad ordered them to be assassinated even though they were non-combatants. When Muhammad had conquered the city called Medina, he ordered all the Jewish people to leave that city. Those who remained, the last Jewish tribe, he rounded up all the men in the city square and chopped off every single one of their heads. His biography says there were 600 or 700 Jewish men in all, though some put the figure as high as 800. I'm not making this up. This is what Muslims have given to us to understand about Muhammad. So when we look at the Quran, the Hadith, and the Sunnah, there's no question that violent jihad is a valid doctrine. It's taught in all three sources without question. And then if we were to look and say, well, do we have any third party attestation to any of this stuff? Well, the answer is no. We have no non-Muslim sources that can tell us anything about those three sources of information because for the most part, none of those people are around until Islam begins to expand and infiltrate other nations and peoples. Now we have a historical record. And so we can even look at Muhammad's successors. What did the people, after Muhammad died, how did they understand what Muhammad was teaching and what Islam was about? And now this becomes a matter simply of a historical record. So take a look at this map. Here you have Saudi Arabia. Uh, Of course, you got the Mediterranean Sea, you got Spain here and Northern Africa. So Mecca is right here in the dark orange part. And this is Medina. So this is the two cities where Muhammad lived and died for the most part. This dark orange part of Saudi Arabia is the portion of Saudi Arabia that was conquered while Muhammad was still alive. Now he dies in 632 AD. Now the key date I want you to remember is 632 AD and then 100 years after is 732 AD. So exactly in 100 years, I want you to see what Islam did in terms of expansion, which is, by the way, not a long time in historical time periods. Within, within those 100 years, Islam conquers all the rest of Saudi Arabia. They travel up to uh, the Middle East and conquer, or I should say, to Jerusalem and Israel. They conquer all the lands of, of Israel and Jerusalem there. They conquer all the rest of the Middle East. They go eastward all the way to the borders of India and China, conquering all of those lands. They travel west across Egypt and conquer North Africa. By the way, why do they not conquer this area down here? What's there? Desert, yeah. And then they conquer sand, right? Okay, so they cross the Strait of Gibraltar. They conquer Spain. And keep in mind, these are Islamic military forces. 
they cross into Spain, conquer Spain. They start to advancing into France. And you'll notice the arrow shows them advancing into France and then making a U-turn. It wasn't because they missed Chipotle and had to turn around and come back. The reason is, is because they ran into Charles Martel, who was known as the Hammer, whose own military forces stopped the invading Muslim forces and forced them to turn around and retreat. And that was at 732 AD. That was the heyday, basically, of Islamic expansion. So from 632 to 732, just 100 years, they conquered all the Middle East, North Africa, and all the lands eastward to the borders of China and India. And when they conquered these people groups, they gave them what's called the triple choice. And again, we know this by simple history. Conquered people were given three options. Number one, convert to Islam. If you convert to Islam, you become a full member of a community, we'll protect you, and you have all the rights of being a Muslim. But of course, many people didn't want to become Muslim. So they said, okay, no problem. You don't have to convert to Islam. You can remain as a Christian, a Jew, or whatever you are. But if you do, you have to pay a poll tax called the jizya. This is a tax that will levy on you, that'll allow you to live in our land, but you'll remain as a second-class citizen. If you don't want to pay the poll tax and you don't want to convert to Islam, then your third option is you got to fight us. You lose, we kill you. Those were the three choices that people were given. And by the way, today in Iraq, where my family is still there, I still have relatives in Iraq, when ISIS has taken control of northern Iraq, of course, they've taken control of, of course, Syria as well, parts of Syria. They are giving these people, including many of the Assyrians who live in that area, the triple choice. Convert to Islam, pay a poll tax, or fight, and of course, be killed, because who's going to be able to over, overcome ISIS? But the problem is the poll tax is so high that they levy on the people of Iraq, and of course, Syria as well, that no one can afford it. And so what do they do? They flee. And why do we have the refugee issue that we're facing now? Because they're fleeing from the Muslims who are imposing the triple choice exactly the way they did in the days of the 7th century and 8th century. Now, I get two kinds of responses from Muslims when they hear this. Number one, people say this. Muslims will say, well, Alan, look, I'm not violent. I don't practice violence. My family doesn't practice violence. So I don't know what you're talking about. We're peaceful people. And again, I want to reiterate, I am not asking the question, do most Muslims practice violence? I would wholeheartedly say no to that. Because I know this is the, I mean, granted, I'm not a scientific demographic expert or something, but of all my interactions with Muslims for years in the United States and in the Middle East, in mosques, I can tell you, yeah, for the most part, my friends and the people I know are peaceful, loving, honorable people. They have come from the Middle East to come and stay with us. When they come to our home, they bring gifts. They are respectful of our traditions. When I go to the Middle East and come to their homes, they are welcoming of me. They, they cook all kinds of amazing food. Very hospitable, respectful, honorable people. So when they say this, I say, well, I agree. I agree you're peaceful. I don't doubt that at all. But this is in spite of what the Quran, the Hadith, and the Sunnah teach, not because of it. I'm glad they're peaceful, but it's not because the Quran says so. The other response I hear people say is, well, and this is what I hear on, you know, the news media. You'll have a Muslim scholar get on and say, well, Islam's a peaceful religion. It's just been hijacked by these violent terrorists. And to this response, I disagree. In fact, I think the opposite is true. I would say that Islam is a violent religion that's been hijacked by peaceful Muslims. That's the reality. Because remember, the Quran, the Hadith, and the Sunnah teach violence, but thankfully, many Muslims don't want to live that way. Even in a very religiously dominated culture like Egypt, where I go to many times, the people there, when when they had very strong, the Muslim Brotherhood and other radical Islamic um, politicians take charge, they overthrew them. Because the Egyptian people don't want to live like 7th century Saudi Arabia. They love modern life. They don't want to live in warfare all their life. And so, again, I know the people are good, peaceful people, but unfortunately, there's a lot of what Islam teaches that is not that way. So again, as you can see, this tactic can help us to make sense of this. Is violent jihad a valid Islamic doctrine? Yes, because the Quran, the Hadith, and the Sunnah teach it. But again, how the people behave is different. What Muslims say and do is different than what Islam teaches, thankfully. 
And by the way, you could apply the same tactic to women in Islam. You wanna know, well, well, what does Islam say about women? Again, you can listen to what Muslims say and do. The key question is, what does the Quran, the Hadith, and the Sunnah teach about, it, about women? That's the key question. We're not gonna do that, but just so you know, that, that's what you could do. So what else can we learn about Islam? Well, there are required behaviors and required beliefs. The required behaviors are known as the five pillars of Islam. Perhaps you've heard of this. These are just five things that every Muslim is supposed to do. Number one, recite the creed. Every Muslim is supposed to say there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. And this is sort of a confessional statement. Indeed, if anyone in this room wants to become a Muslim today, all you got to do is say that creed and of course sincerely believe it. And you started your journey as a Muslim. It's kind of equivalent to like the sinner's prayer in Christianity. First step, but not the only step, okay? Muslims are also required to pray five times a day. They're supposed to face towards Mecca, Saudi Arabia, and pray because they believe that Allah has commanded everyone to face Mecca uh, in Saudi Arabia. And in Mecca, you'll see a, a structure which they have to face in a minute. Muslims are also required to fast during Ramadan. This is a month long fast where Muslims abstain from food, drink, smoking, and sex during the daylight hours. So that lasts a month long and it's to commemorate. <laughs> I don't know what was funny there. But maybe you think you only drink, you know, smoke, have sex and stuff at night, but I don't know. <clears throat> Either way, they're not allowed to do it during the daylight hours. But uh, <clears throat> again, maybe most people are at work, so that's probably why. I don't know. Anyways, so this is to commemorate Muhammad receiving the Quran. And they believe that Muhammad received the Quran from an angel known as the angel Gabriel that the angel Gabriel communicated the verses of the Quran over a 22 year period. And this is to commemorate that event. Muslims are also required to give to the poor and needy about 2.5%. So if you happen to believe in a 10% tithe in Christianity, it's cheaper to become a Muslim, you know, look at that. So <laughs> another incentive. I'm not saying you should do it. You know. And then at least once in the lifetime of a Muslim, they are required to travel to Saudi Arabia and for about a week or so, perform a pilgrimage known as the Hajj and where they perform a number of different rituals. This, by the way, is the mosque in Mecca, Saudi Arabia, which is the most sacred mosque in all of Islam. And in the center of it, there's this structure, which is a 30 foot by 30 foot cube shaped structure that it's called the Kaaba. And they believe that Allah commanded perhaps Abraham to build this. And now everyone is supposed to face in that direction when they pray. If you happen to be inside it, you could pray in any direction. Not that anyone here would ever be inside it. <laughs> but um, you actually, no, no non-Muslims even allowed in the city of Mecca. So uh, you're definitely not going to be in the city, let alone in the mosque, let alone in the Kaaba. If you do, I, I can't imagine how that ever happened. But anyways, that's just, that's what the Kaaba is. So those are required behaviors. Five things that Muslims are required to do. But there are also six articles of faith. These are required beliefs. Doctrinal affirmations. Number one is the most important one, and that is the belief in one God. And in fact, if you know nothing or forget everything about Islam, but remember this, Islam believes there is one God and this one God exists as one person. So what does that doctrine, what is it specifically rejecting? That's right, Trinitarianism. They, whole, they vigorously reject Trinitarianism. Okay, because they would say there's one God and this one God cannot have any associates like Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And to suggest that anyone or anything has divine attributes other than the one God is to commit the greatest sin in Islam. It's called the sin of shirk. It is an unpardonable sin. Meaning if you, for example, believe that Jesus is the son of God or part of the Trinity, you have committed the sin of shirk. And if you die, you are guaranteed to go to hell. Do not pass go, do not collect 200, go straight to hell, okay? So it, it's, a, it's a very serious um, uh, sin in Islam, the greatest sin. Now, related to this idea that there is only one God and this one God is, is a unity, it's a, it's a Unitarian God, there's also a question about whether Muslims and Christians worship the same God. It's a question that actually our culture, Christian culture has kind of been debating for a while. And I know there's a lot of Christians that say, Actually, I think we do worship the same God. Now, I'm gonna to beg to differ with those Christians, so don't, don't 
kill me right now if, if, you, if you take that side. It's, it's okay, we can disagree. But I'm of, the, I'm of the inclination to think that we don't worship the same God. And I wanna just offer you my rationale as to why I think this is the case, just briefly. It's not in your notes, but it's bonus, no extra charge. I'll, I mean, if you wanna make a donation, that's fine. But It's important to realize that the word God is not God's name. God is more like, and here's an illustration, Tim Yulhoff would be very happy with me. God is more like the title of a position than it is the name of a person. So think of the president of the United States or the office of the president of the United States. Okay? The office of the president of the United States is the title of a position. It's a what. But it is a person who occupies that position. The title of the position is a what. The person who occupies that position is a who. All right. Now, of course, the president of the United States, that office entails certain powers, like veto powers, the power to nominate federal judges, uh, executive powers, and so on and so forth. Okay. So that, that title has all these powers, but of course, it, it could be a number of different people who might occupy that position as president. In the same way, both Christians and Muslims believe in God, they believe in the same what, this title of a position, this God who creates, who judges, who hears prayer, and so on and so forth. But they believe it is a different person who occupies the position of God. They say it is a person named Allah. We say the person is Yahweh. And then when you evaluate the various characteristics of the person of Allah or Yahweh, you come to realize they are fundamentally different. Allah is a unitarian God. Yahweh is a Trinitarian God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Allah does not have a son. Yahweh has a son. Allah is transcendent, which means he is separate from his creation. Yahweh is also transcendent. He is separate from his creation. But Yahweh also is imminent, which means he enters into his creation and has relationships with his created beings. And you can go on and on with all these different characteristics and realize that Allah and Yahweh are fundamentally different persons. So, I understand the temptation to want to say, yeah, we believe in the same God, but it's really that we believe in the same type of God, a God who creates and administrates, but we believe it's a different person, a different who that occupies that position, that office of God. And perhaps the best way to see this is this. Imagine Jesus was to appear on this stage right now. I submit to you that every Christian in this room would bow down and worship Jesus as God. But if there's a Muslim in the room, that Muslim would not bow down and worship Jesus as God. Why? Because Christians and Muslims do not both worship Jesus as God. For a Christian to worship Jesus as God is to commit a great act of devotion. But for a Muslim to worship Jesus as God is to commit the greatest sin in Islam, the sin of shirk. So how can it be that we worship the same God? If we both do not worship Jesus as God, Christians do. We worship Jesus as God. That's our God. But Muslims do not. That's why I don't think we worship the same God. We worship the same type of God, but a different person. Okay. Believe in God's angels. Muslims are required to believe that there are two angels that follow you throughout your entire life. One keeps track of all your good deeds. Another keeps track of all your bad deeds. So last night when you heard that whispering and you were alone, it could have been an angel being like, oh yeah, Frank just did another sin. No, or, or a good thing. <laughs> Muslims also have to believe in God's prophets that Allah has commissioned human beings to be spokespersons, if you will, or prophets for Allah. And there's been a prophet to every people group in humanity at some point. Turns out a lot of biblical characters turn out to be prophets in Islam. It's rather interesting. So for example, they believe Adam was a prophet of Allah. They would say that Moses was a prophet of Allah. They would say David, as in King David, was a prophet of Allah. They would say that Jesus even was a prophet of Allah. And of course, they also say that Muhammad was a prophet of Allah. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so as you know, uh, showing images of Muhammad is extremely unpopular. And uh, so since a lot of Muslims attend my events, I don't, I don't show a picture of Muhammad. It doesn't matter to me whether I show it or not. So, but there's no need for me to unnecessarily offend Muslims. But anyways, notice that belief in Jesus is required according to Islam. 
Now, granted, they don't believe that Jesus is the same person that we believe he is, right? The Muslim Jesus, if you want to call it that, was not the son of God, was not part of the Trinity, didn't die, didn't get resurrected, and of course, couldn't have atoned for sins since he didn't die and resurrect. According to Islam, Jesus is merely a human being and a prophet, just like we would say that Moses was a human being and a prophet, or like, like Muslims would say that Muhammad was a human being and a prophet. But despite this sort of lower version of, of, of Jesus that Muslims often talk about, it's rather interesting when you read the Quran. Because remember, Muslims say things, but Islam teaches different things. And what's interesting is when I read the Quran, I noticed a number of very respectable characteristics that are attributed to Jesus. For example, according to the Quran, Jesus' birth was announced by angels. No one here probably had an angel announcing their birth. Significant, right? According to the Quran, Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. According to the Quran, Jesus performed miracles like healing the sick and raising the dead. It teaches that he lived a sinless and perfect life. The Quran teaches that Jesus was even called the Messiah on numerous occasions. And according to the Quran, Jesus did not die, but rather was taken up to be in the presence of Allah. And in some versions of Islam, he's even the appointed one to return at the end of time to kill the Antichrist, to break all the crosses, and to kill the pigs. So no more pulled pork sandwiches at that point. (laughs) That'll be a bummer. But notice, that's significant, that Jesus has that high of a status in the Quran. Now, contrast that with what the Quran teaches about Muhammad. According to the Quran, there was no announcement about Muhammad's birth. He had a, just a normal birth. It doesn't attribute any miracles to him. It doesn't say he was sinless. It doesn't call him the Messiah. And according to the Quran, Muhammad is dead and buried in Saudi Arabia for the last 1400 years. And he is not coming back. That's pretty significant that the Quran affirms those two things about Jesus and Muhammad. And what this tells you is this. If you want to share your faith with a Muslim, by all means, you can talk about Jesus because they're required to believe in him. And the Quran talks more about Jesus than it does even about Muhammad. And it elevates Jesus in a very significant way. So by all means, you can definitely talk about Jesus. And of course, since he's so central to the gospel, I highly recommend you do. Now, in addition to believing in God's prophets, Muslims are also required to believe that many of these prophets were given divine revelation or given scripture. And so Muslims are required to believe in all of the scriptures that were given to prophets. And the Quran actually identifies four of them. I'll give you the first one. The first scripture that the Quran affirms is the Quran itself. (laughs) So clearly the Quran teaches that itself is a divine revelation from Allah. But it turns out there are three other divine revelations that are on par with the Quran. Does anyone know what one of the other ones is? I heard Old Testament. You have to be more specific. The Pentateuch, Pentateuch, yes. So the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, are considered to be a true revelation on par with the Quran given to which prophet? Yeah, Moses. That's right. Okay. Okay. Can anyone remember any of the other prophets and who? Yes, I heard Psalms. So the Psalms are another true revelation on par with the Quran given to the prophet David. That's right. And then what's the last one? What's that? Soledad? No? Yes, the gospel. The gospel is considered to also be, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, a true revelation on par with the Quran Given to which prophet? Jesus, okay? Now, I know what you're probably thinking. Wait a minute. If they have to believe in the gospel, for example, that it's a true revelation from Allah, well, why don't they believe what we believe about Jesus? That he died, rose again, that he was crucified, all that stuff, that he is, uh, you know, one with the Father, and all the things that Jesus says about himself. Does anyone know what the reason is? That they would say, well, we believe in the gospel, but we deny all that stuff. That's right, because they believe that although all those are true revelations from Allah, only the Quran has remained free from corruption. The Torah, Psalms, and Gospel have become corrupted. The Christians and Jews either were irresponsible or intentionally changed the 
scriptures. And so now the Torah, Psalms, and gospel contains man's, man's wisdom and God's wisdom. And since it's mixed together, we don't know which is which. Only the Quran has remained free from corruption. This, by the way, is the most common objection that you will hear from a Muslim. If you're talking to any Muslim, I don't care where you are, they all believe the Bible, Torah, Psalms, and gospel are corrupted. Now, this is not only the most common objection you'll get, it's the most significant one. And here's why. Where's the true identity of Jesus and the plan of salvation found? In the gospel. But that's the one source of authority, not the one, but it's one of the sources of authority that they'll reject and say, no, that's not relevant. It's because it's distorted, it's corrupted, we can't know what's in there is accurate. So let me just quickly offer you a tactic that I use to overcome this. Because I want to proclaim Jesus. I want to talk to them about how they can receive a pardon from God and proclaim the message of reconciliation like Paul tells us to do. But I can't do it from the gospel, even though it's identified in the Quran, because they say it's corrupted. Well, here's the key. Remember I, made, I said to make a distinction between two things. What Muslims say, and what's the other thing? What, yeah, what Quran or what Islam teaches. Two different things. And it turns out that although Muslims say the Bible, and when I say Bible, I mean Torah, Psalms, and Gospel. Although Muslims say it's corrupted, it turns out the Quran does not teach it's corrupted. In fact, it says the opposite. And here's how I know. The Quran teaches two important principles. Number one, the Quran teaches that no one can change the words of God. And I wrote there four citations, Surah 634, meaning chapter 6, verse 34, chapter 6, verse 115, 1064, and 1827, and about a dozen other places where the Quran clearly teaches no one can change the words of God, because after all, God is God. He can protect his own revelation. So the Quran teaches that, but it also teaches the second thing. It teaches that the Bible, and when I say Bible, I mean the Torah, Psalms, and Gospel. The Bible is an example of the word of God. So think with me then what follows logically. If the Quran says no one can change the words of God, and the Quran says the Bible is an example of the word of God, then therefore, according to the Quran, the Bible is the unchanged word of God. I, it's so straightforward. And so this is what I offer to the Muslim who says to me, oh, Alan, you explained the gospel to me. You told me about Jesus, but that's all good and fine, except it's in the gospels, it's corrupted. I say, but, but wait a minute. According to your Quran, the Gospels aren't corrupted. They're the unchanged word of God, according to your highest authority. In fact, years ago, I was invited to a maximum security state prison. It's called Sentinel State Prison. It's in Southern California, just near the border of Mexico. The chaplain there had invited me to come and teach the Christians who are inmates in prison. There's like hundreds of Christians there. A lot of these Christians are in a cell with a Muslim... And guess what? They have a lot of time on their hands, okay? So they said, well, why don't you come and teach these Christians how to witness to their Muslim cellmates, you know, about the gospel? I said, okay, sure. So I get there, and as you can imagine, security is like through the roof. I have these two armed security guards on either side of me accompanying me as I go through all these gates. So the first gate opens. They accompany me through the first gate. The gate closes behind us. A fence opens up. They accompany me across the fence. The fence closes behind us. This wall opens up. I mean, it's like crazy. Finally, we get to the very last fence. And it's the fence that, that separates, you know, everyone from the prisoners in the prison yard. So the prison yard door opens. I walk through. It closes behind me. And I look back behind me. And I notice the guards were on the other side. <laughs> and I'm like, um, I didn't see that in the fine print anywhere. What's going on? Uh, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, you didn't know? Yeah, you're going to be in the prison yard with the prisoners all day. And we'll come and get you at 4 o'clock. Have a good day. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so I'm thinking, okay, uh, I'm going to die. I, so these prisoners start looking over at me, noticing me, and they start walking towards me. I'm like, I am going to die. Lord, into your hands, I commit my spirit, you know. <laughs> so one of them comes up to me, and I look at him, and I'm like, um, hi. He's like, are you Brother Allen? I'm like, Oh, yes, I am, Brother Allen. Yes. <laughs> I'm your brother. They said, hey, he said, he said, I'm one of the Christians here that uh, are looking forward to hearing about you speak today. I'm like, oh, fantastic. He says, do you have any handout notes we can give some of the other inmates as they listen to your lecture later on today? I said, sure. So I gave him some handout notes, kind of like the ones you got. 
he hands him to another prisoner who goes off to make photocopies. I didn't know they had photocopy machines in maximum security <laughs> prison, but whatever. Well, it turns out that guy making photocopies is a Muslim. So as he's walking to the place, he's looking at my notes. He's like, hey, this Christian's going to be speaking about Islam later on today. So in addition to making photocopies, you know what he does? He tells all the Muslims in prison as well <laughs> that I'm going to be teaching. So that afternoon, I'm sitting there at the, at the front. All these people, all these Christians are pouring in. And all these Muslim prisoners are pouring in too. And I'm like, I will die today for sure. <laughs> So I said, well, what can I do now? I'm stuck here till four, so better, here we go. So I presented a, a presentation based on this material for about 40 minutes. And then I said, okay, are there any questions from you, from the audience? And all the Christians had their hands down because they're wondering, you know, I want to see what my Muslim you know, friends are going to say, right? So find some Muslims in the back, raise their hands. I call on the first guy. And the Muslim says, you know, we haven't heard this before, but as I was tracking with you, I was checking out the verses you were citing and I I, I think I have to agree. You're right. The Quran does not teach the Bible is corrupted. And I said, oh, okay, thank you. Yes, of course. <laughs> Another Muslim raises his hand. And I said, yes. He goes, you know what? He goes, I agree with you. Yeah, you're right. This is new to us, but yeah, it makes sense what you're saying. It doesn't teach the Bible is corrupted. I said, oh, okay. A third Muslim raises his hand, but he jumps up, turns to his Muslim friends and says, brothers, what are you doing? How can you agree with this Christian? Of course the Bible is corrupted. And then he begins to cite a verse in the Quran, which sounds like it says the Bible is corrupted. But then guess who came to my defense? Yeah, the two Muslims. They stand up and say, no, brother, sit down. We, 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 we've, we've looked at that passage. We know what that says. It does not teach the Bible is corrupted. It says that the Christians misinterpret what the Bible says, but the text is pure. Now, why did this work? It didn't work because I, I gave some clever argument for why the Bible's reliable. What I did was I leveraged their commit, Muslim commitment to the Quran to my advantage. Since the Quran is the highest authority, if you can show that it teaches something, a Muslim must believe it. They have no option. It's literally like for Christ to tell us something, we would have to believe whatever he says. And that's what it's like to them. The Quran is so highly authoritative in their mind, I was simply leveraging their commitment to it to my advantage. And now once the objection that the Bible is corrupted is off the table, guess what I can do? Present what the gospels say. This is who Jesus is. Now that you know it's not corrupted, listen to who Jesus says he is. Listen to the gospel. And then I get to present the gospel without the objection that, oh, it's corrupted. So that's why I say this tactic is super helpful. In fact, I mention a lot, I talk about this tactic in great detail in that book that actually Craig Hazen was mentioning. They're selling it in the back. It's a short book, like 60 pages. You can knock that sucker out in like two hours. But a third of it is just on that particular tactic. So I encourage you to check it out if you want. Now, going back with our, um, our final, um, uh, what do you call it? The required behaviors, I'm sorry, required beliefs. Muslims are also required to believe in the final judgment. All right? So they believe at the end of time, Allah will resurrect all humans and they'll be judged according to their deeds. And their deeds will be put on a scale. And by the way, how will we know which good deeds and bad deeds you've committed? That's right, the two angels that have been following you along. So all the good deeds will be put on a scale, all the bad deeds will be put on a scale, and they'll be weighed. So if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, you go to heaven. If your bad deeds outweigh your good deeds, you go to hell. So notice they have a meritorious based system of salvation and they have no way of knowing, are they certain they're going to heaven or not? In fact, this is the, this is the problem. And, and this is one of the ways actually I encourage Christians to start a conversation with the Muslims. This is what I do all the time. I say to a Muslim, excuse me, do you have 100% certainty you are going to heaven? I've never had a Muslim tell me, yeah, I'm 100% certain. Why? Because they can't possibly know. Who knows what good deeds and bad deeds they've committed? Who knows, you know? So um, what can we as Christians offer them? Or I should say, what does Jesus offer them? Assurance, confidence of their salvation. And so that's why another way you can get back into to Jesus there. They also believe that uh, everything that happens is according to the divine decree of Allah. So they have this sort of fatalistic sense about what happens in life. And then let me... Uh, finish off with uh, the second section here about engagement. Because remember I said, as ambassadors for Jesus Christ, we want to learn, but then we also have to engage, okay? That's what, that's what political ambassadors do. That's what we as Christians need to do as well. 
And by the way, it's really easy to do so. When I first started witnessing to Muslims, I remember going to a Southern California neighborhood where I knew lots of Muslims lived. And I was driving around, I saw a strip mall that had some Arabic script on the restaurant signs. So I thought this must be the right place. I saw these two guys that looked like me walking to a restaurant. I thought they must be Muslims. So I ran up to them, I stopped them just before they went in. I said, excuse me, are you guys Muslims? They're like, um, yeah, this is post 9-11. So they were a little suspicious. They're like, yeah, why? I said, great, I, I'm a Christian. I said, would you like to talk about God and Jesus in the Bible? And what do you think they said? They said, yeah, we'd love to. Hey, why don't you come inside and sit down with us? I'm like, okay. So we go down and sit down for hours. We talk about Jesus and God and the Bible. Of course, we didn't agree, but nevertheless, we had a great time. Eventually, I'm like, I gotta get going home. So I pull out my wallet to pay for my portion of the meal. And they said, no, 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 no. We insist on paying for your portion of the meal as well. Contrast that experience with what would have happened had I walked up to two average Americans in a mall and said to them, excuse me, I'm a Christian. You want to talk about Jesus and the Bible? What do you think they'd say? <laughs> yeah, get lost, freak. That's, no, we don't talk about Jesus. And this tells us something. Muslims love talking about Jesus, love talking about God and the Bible. Starting conversation with a Muslim is like, about religion is like starting conversation about sports with an American. You just start it and it goes, okay? It's virtually effortless. And so we should take advantage of the opportunity that they're so willing to talk about stuff that typically Americans think is politically incorrect. Also, there's about 1.5 billion Muslims on the planet. So there's plenty of opportunity to talk to people, okay? One in five people on earth is a Muslim. It's a lot of Muslims. We think that about 38,000 Muslims die every single day in entry journey without Jesus. That's a lot of Muslims. You know, the Los Angeles Lakers, God bless their souls, are not doing so great this year. But anyways, uh, they play in Staples Center, which holds 18,000 max. It's like two arenas that hold, you know, all the Lakers. I don't know what Golden State Warriors, how big their stadium is, but I'm sure it's about similar. Double that occupancy is how many Muslims die every single day in interior eternity without Christ. We think about 70% of them are nominal, in name only, and have nothing to do with religious violence or jihad, or any of that stuff. They don't practice their religion. They just are in name only. 15% are reformed. They do take their faith seriously, but well, let's just say they try to reinterpret the more violent texts. And about 15% of them do take those texts very seriously and try to um, engage in violent jihad or financially support it or attitudinally support it. Okay? So again, going back to my previous point, most Muslims that we estimate are not violent people. Okay. Yeah, 15% includes about, what, 225 million worldwide, which is like two-thirds of the population of America. So, yes, there is a large percentage of people who do that, but not all of them are like that. In fact, most are not. How should we engage them? Well, the way an ambassador would. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy about the manner in which we should communicate with any of those Muslims, whether the Reformed, nominal, or violent extremist ones, it doesn't matter. Paul says, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. So even though Muslims sometimes from Middle Eastern cultures get really loud and, uh, let me just say, because I'm from Middle East, obnoxious. <laughs> I, I married a German woman, okay? So when my wife first married me and she came over to my parents' house and my parents are like yelling back and forth and, and my mom's like, why are they arguing? I'm like, oh no, they're just talking about dinner. It's fine, you know. <laughs> That's just the way they are. <laughs> Middle Eastern people sometimes get really, look, even if they're that way with you, we do not have the right to be quarrelsome and mean-spirited and harsh and condescending because we are bond servants. We are ambassadors for Jesus. We represent him. So remember that. Practically speaking, here's my suggestion. Don't focus, if you're talking to a Muslim, on the question of jihad. I know I brought it up here as an interesting sort of academic question. Does Islam teach that? That's fine for us to discuss it. But when it comes to witnessing to Muslims or sharing with your Muslim neighbor, I don't think it ever is helpful to bring it up because most Muslims just get defensive. I also don't recommend you talk about Muhammad and how he married 11 wives and his youngest wife was only six years old when he was in his 50s. I get it. That's disturbing and disgusting. But I tell you, you bring that stuff up and I'm telling you, walls go up. 
Instead, focus on what matters, the gospel. Muslims, even if they abandon their views on jihad, their eternal destinies are still in jeopardy if they haven't received a pardon from God for the crimes they've committed against him. That's the gospel. That's the message of reconciliation that Paul tells us to communicate. That's what we've received. That's what we want everyone else to receive as well. So focus on the gospel. And finally, let me close with this thought here. I know that a lot of people said after September 11th that we became engaged in a war, a war against terrorism and a war against Muslim extremists. They were right about one thing. We are engaged in a war, but they are wrong about two things. And that is when the war began and who we are at war with. You see, the war did not begin when the first plane hit the World Trade Center. It began when Eve took her first bite. And it is not a war against Muslims, even Muslim terrorists or extremists, right? They are, they are not the enemy. They are casualties of war. They are hostages of the enemy. The real enemy is Satan, his army, his lies. He is the true terrorist. In fact, five chapters after Paul tells us our identity and our mission, that we are ambassadors, he then tells us the nature of the war that we're in. In 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, he says, For though we live in the world, we don't wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. It's not tanks and missiles and planes. That's the weapons the world fights with. Paul says, on the contrary, the weapons we fight with have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. You see, it is the enemy, Satan, who has erected the stronghold of Islam and has captured 20% of the world's population. So between now and tomorrow at this very moment, another 38,000 souls will be claimed by Satan who will enter eternity without Jesus. So never forget, yes, we are at war. Yes, the enemy is real, but Muslims are not the enemy. They are hostage of the enemy. And God has commissioned you as ambassadors for Christ to proclaim the message of reconciliation. That's your identity and that's your mission. Thank you very much. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.